I'm very happy to be back here in the Twin Cities and to meet my old and new friends once again. The title of the lecture this evening is The Illusion of the Human Role. I don't know how they pick up these titles. <laughs> But I'm glad they do so because if I were asked to pick up a title, I would be stumped. I wouldn't know what titles to pick up. But it doesn't really make too much difference what title they pick up. As many of you who have heard me before know whatever title they pick up, I say the same thing. <laughs> because I, what I want to share with you is something so downright simple, so obvious, so free from complexities, so free from all the speculation, so free from philosophy, that it's hard to hide that behind a title. What I am trying to share with you is that we as human beings are certain of one thing, and of that we are certain irrespective of what anybody else says or what is written in the books, and that is that we are conscious beings. This is a certainty with which we are born. This is a certainty we live with every day. Nobody can take it away from us. Nobody can come and convince us, no, you are not conscious. Because the very process of experiencing life, the very process of being makes us conscious beings. And this particular state we have of being conscious is the only subject which is the subject of my talks. Therefore, the subject of my talks is self-evident. It's self-evident to everybody who participates. If somebody walks into my lecture and is not conscious, he won't know the lecture at all. So I will not be missing the mark or saying something wrong by saying that everybody who is listening to this lecture knows the subject of this lecture. And the subject is consciousness, awareness, that we are gifted as beings enclosed in a wonderful body called the human body, which is one of the most beautiful things ever created. Living in that body, conscious and aware, not only of the body, but of all that goes outside of the body. That is what makes human life. That is what makes us. That is what makes human beings. And sitting in the body and looking out through all the various windows and apertures, the eyes, the ears, the other sense perceptions, we are able to have access to a wonderful experience of life. And we say, this is great. And all the inquiry and all the investigation starts from that point. So we are certain of where we are, but we are uncertain of where others are. One cannot be sure if anybody else is there at all or not. Maybe there's only one person. Supposing we went to sleep and had a dream. In the dream, we saw hundreds of people. And we move in the midst of that dream and move in the streets of the town, dreamland, and see hundreds of people and recognize our friends and recognize those who are not friends those who look strangers, and we see different trees and plants and houses and buildings, and we say, what kind of creation is this? In this dream, who is real? Are they all real? They look real. But who is real? The answer will be the one who is looking at all that. Because even if you wake up and the dream disappears, the dreamer still remains now in a state of wakefulness. The same dreamer who is awake was the being that saw the dream and saw all those people and all those places which disappeared when we woke up. While the dream was going on, they looked real. The places looked real. The people looked real. When we woke up, they all disappeared. They were unreal. But the dreamer, the central being around whom all the other beings existed, that continues to be real. The dreamer continues to be real, but not even the dream body. The body in which we dreamt and walked about, even that disappeared. And we woke up to find that our real body was different. That the process of dreaming, which is a process of conscious experiencing, the process of dreaming 
invents not only the pattern of a dream, but invents the pattern of our own body through which we dream. And that body which we are using in the dream is as unreal as the rest of the dream. And yet the dreamer is more real than anything in the dream. This is our everyday experience. Therefore, when you look at life closely and without speculation, without philosophy, just a close, obvious look at life, you find there is only one thing of which you are certain at all times, that you as a conscious being, as an experiencer, exist. And nobody can challenge it, nobody can change it. That's the beauty of being. When we find out that our being is unchallenged and is not open to scrutiny or question, that everything else is open to scrutiny and question, it makes things very simple. It makes them simple because at least we have a starting point. We have a focal point, a central point, which is real and continues to be real at all times. Putting ourselves in the real place, we can then start seeing what is illusion around it. The consciousness from which we are experiencing everything continues to be real at any state of consciousness. There is no experience known to us in which the conscious self disappears. There is no such experience. Some people say, no, we have had experience. We went for surgery and when we lay on the surgeon's table and ether was given to us, we just disappeared. It was after so many hours we got up. And then you question them, what was happening to you in the meantime? Then some of them, if they put their attention, they say, oh, we had a wonderful dream in the meanwhile. We felt we were floating somewhere. And all the memory of that period, which they thought was totally blanked out, comes back. But more cleverly designed is the continuity of consciousness, that consciousness can slip from now to tomorrow and give us the feeling we slept all night. There may be no gap in between at all. What we call as the missing awareness is merely an experience of disjointed continuity of experience as we have logically put it. We have logically designed that time should flow in a certain way. Who decides time to flow in a certain way? Our watches and clocks, little machines. We invented them and we said they will determine. Supposing I wear my watch and say, oh, it's about 8 o'clock now and after a few minutes, I look at it, say, 9 o'clock, wow, I've been talking for an hour. I might have talked for five minutes. I'll still start believing I talked for an hour. Why? Because I look at this watch, and this determines the passage of time, and therefore the passage of experience around me. I will disbelieve my personal experience and believe what the clock is saying, what the watch is saying, what the calendar is saying. We can be making stupid fools of ourselves by relying on machines and not on our direct experience. When we are waiting for somebody and time doesn't pass, we think over so many things and we could make so many phone calls. I know when I make a long distance phone call, I find I have talked two, three minutes and it says 40 minutes over. <laughs> and, and when something is happening and I'm waiting and I can think out all the things that I can say in 40 minutes and I find only three minutes are over. What is this? What is this nature of time? What is time really? Is time really so absolute that these little machines can determine what is time? Or is time what consciousness creates? We have created a logical sequence of events linked together in cause and effect relationships. The moment cause and effect and a linear time sequence can be put together, we say this is real. We have gone so mad after this logical sequence that we are willing to denounce our own self and say, I must be making a mistake. This must be real. We are willing to accept the reality of a chronometer, of a watch, and not accept the reality of consciousness operating continuously and giving us experience. This has led to feelings that maybe so much time has passed and I passed out. I blacked out. There is no such thing. Go over your own experiences again and go over the experiences of those who think they blacked out. 
and you can give them the recollection of all that happened. At one time, people used to feel that when we go to sleep at night, we cut off our consciousness, we switch it off, and we come back in the morning and switch it on. And this gives rest, not only to the body, but also to the mind, to consciousness, to soul, everything is on rest. Till the researchers into dream patterns began to find out that we are dreaming all the time. And you can wake up a person at any time in the middle and record what dream is going on. You can watch the eyelids, the rapid eye movements, the REMs, and see what the person is watching. You can predict in advance just by looking at the eyelids of a person sleeping, whether he's seeing an action in a dream that is situated vertically like a waterfall, or he's seeing a tennis match going on and he's moving like this. You can see while he's sleeping and from his eyelids. And the person wakes up in the morning and said, oh, what a sound sleep I had. I saw nothing. And he was dreaming all the time. This ability to forget, this ability to link certain things together in cause and effect relationship gives us the misleading information about ourselves that we can black out, consciousness is just a part of a function of the body, that the body is real. All these philosophies and assumptions that we have come upon are based upon these illusions and mistakes that we make. If we are willing to look at the obvious, we'll find how can we destroy the obvious existence of the spectator, of the witness. We say this world is so long, so old, the sky is so high, the space is running into billions and billions of light years. Who is saying all this if there is no witness, no spectator? There is no light here and there is no space and there is no cosmos. Even Einstein, who gave us such fantastic ideas about time, such fantastic ideas about the curvature of space and about the very nature of space, before his death, he conceded that one thing he had not given sufficient attention to, which should be given attention and is probably the key to further inquiry into the nature of existence, is the position of the subjective observer. The subjective observer determines the whole creation. Indeed, it has been well said that we as human beings are nothing more than points of view of a single subjective viewing of creation. That if creation is just something set up by a creator, and the creator, we don't know who the creator is and where he is, we might look for him. But till we find him, it is obvious that we are all individually looking at the same creation made by the same creator from different points of view. Therefore, we are nothing but points of view, subjective points of view of a single spectator. Who, what is he seeing? What is he witnessing? His own creation. So this is a strange situation in which we are placed that we have the ability to observe, the ability to be in the center of things. We never move. We have never gone to the edge of experience. Because whenever we are looking at experience around us, we are always in the center. And we create experience all around us. Experience moves around us, we don't move. Because when we look at the dream, in the dream, supposing we travel a thousand miles in a dream car of our own fantasy, we drive very fast and we go a thousand miles and see new places, we have actually gone nowhere. We have allowed the scene to change, almost like sitting in a movie hall. Almost like three-dimensional movies now they show with the uh, cir circle, circle or rama or something, screens on all sides, and you sit in the center and you feel you are moving along with them. You don't move. It's the, it's the projection, the section, the shadows on the screens that keep on moving. It's quite possible that in this four, five, six, twenty, we don't know how many dimensions there are of the known forms in which experience can be gathered by a conscious being. But whatever the number of dimensions, it is possible that the experience is moving around us and we are moving statically, without moving. We are getting a feeling of movement through it. The only real thing is that we are experiencing this movement and this change. It's great to have this feeling that we are going through a movement and instead of ascribing the movement to the things that are moving around us, we say we are moving through it. That world is fixed, it goes according to the laws of cause and effect, and we can enunciate those laws, we can explain the whole world by those laws, and we are moving in this world and trying to find our way. 
this particular viewpoint looking at life as if the world is fixed generated forever and we have come for a little while and we have to move through this life as best as we can and then drop dead and go away this gives us so many disadvantages it gives us a disadvantage of putting us at the mercy of the creation outside it puts us at the mercy of other people around us it makes us helpless it makes everybody else around us a controller of our destiny it looks strange that we should be such helpless little ants in a huge creation which is all around us surrounding us and controlling what we have to do why can't we take the other view that we have come into this physical dimension of experience to take a dip into this experience like we do every night when we go to sleep and have a dream when we dream we create that world which we need for the dream we create those people we want to see in the dream our mind projects a certain dream after it is over we wake up into a real world and the dream ends it has served its purpose why can't we take this world to be of the same type there's only one problem we have evidence that when we go to sleep at night every morning we wake up so we know the nature of the dream and this physical existence in which we are placed in the human role we do not know if there is a waking up from here and we can find out if it is a dream how would we approach this question if somebody came an expert would come an expert of consciousness came to us and said what you are seeing is a dream there is no difference in this dream than in the dream you have at night that this looks as real as that dream when you are dreaming that the dream you have at night becomes unreal only when you wake up that if you were to wake up from this physical dream into a still higher level of consciousness you will find there is no difference between the two dreams how would you react somebody comes and gives this proposition you would say let me wake up and see there is no other way there is no other way of convincing oneself this is a dream except by waking up just like there is no other way of convincing yourself at night that you are dreaming except by waking up at night if in the dream somebody were to talk to us in the dream you know you are dreaming this is not real you will challenge it you will question you will fight till you wake up and they say what am i fighting for there was nobody to fight this nature of experience which we are having now which we call the wakeful human experience whether it is a dream or not we can only know by waking up to a next higher level of wakefulness provided there are levels of wakefulness some people claim there are levels of wakefulness we don't want to go by claims because if we accept anybody's claim we get into the same philosophy the same religion the same blind following that we are trying to criticize we are trying to see what is experiential for us therefore we should be able to have at least some experience of wakefulness which can be retained with us for a while so we can say yes this is of the same nature as a dream what is the best way of waking up a person who is sleeping and having a dream i have often thought of it that if i were sleeping and i would be having my favorite dream my favorite dream is to be eating lovely supreme pizza of pizza hut <laughs> i like it i say i like that so i am eating my pizza and i am enjoying it in the dream and somebody is looking at me sleeping they can't see the pizza and my friend who is awake he wants to wake me up he says get up and he nudges me on the side wake up wake up and i say oh what about my pizza he and he says don't worry i'll hold your pizza now when he is saying that he is awake he is not seeing any pizza he is participating in my dream and i am beginning to see him and hear his voice in the dream and he says come i'll hold your pizza while you wake up i give my pizza i said okay i'll wake up take my pizza hold it for me and he holds the pizza and i wake up and i find there is no pizza and i can't even tell that friend of mine that you were lying like a rug all this time <laughs> saying you are going to hold my pizza there was no pizza why did you say that and the friend will say my purpose was not to interfere with you supposing i had got into an argument there is no pizza you would have said there is i am eating one and your dream would have continued by arguing about the existence of a certain experience my friend would have said you would have kept on sleeping and having your dream and gone deeper into sleep 
in order to hold on more tightly to the pizza you created in your dream. Therefore, to wake you up, I went along with you and said, yes, I will hold your pizza. And then getting the security of a friend, knowing there's a friend holding your dear possessions for you, you were able to wake up and find out the truth. If such be the case, can we not consider putting the same position here now in our physical life? That if physical life is also a kind of dream of a higher level, and there is a still higher level of wakefulness to which we can go, and a person who is awake in that higher level, whom we are not seeing here because he has not spoken to us, we are clinging to our attachments in the dream, which are like our pizzas. We are clinging to our families, friends, jobs, money, automobiles, all the things of this world for which we have cultivated desires and attachments. We are holding on to them. And somebody speaks to us and says, come on, this is not real. Don't you want to get to find out what is your reality? That your consciousness is not inhibited by just being physical in a dream state? Wake up. And we say, no, let me finish this work. I'll come to you later, wherever you are. I'll do it. I have plenty of time. After retirement, I plan to listen to your voice and go in. But right now, I have to look after all these things. I have responsibilities. I am accountable for all this. All this kind of argument. If that voice of the wakeful one interferes and says, no, this is not real. Your wife is not real. Your children are not real. Your parents are not real. This world is not real. The food you eat is not real. You ultimately say, this man is mad. This voice is not real. And you stay on with the reality of the physical world and don't pay any heed. Therefore, a person who is truly awakened, awakened and enlightened to a level higher than this level, if he were to come and wake us up, he would participate in our dream as if this is real. And he would say, yes, I'll take care of this. You have a problem? Don't worry. This can be managed. We can take care of these things. And by participating and creating a sense of security that there is a friend who can take care of it when we build sufficient confidence in a friend who is like a friend in this world, then alone are we willing to wake up to a higher level. People miss this point. People think meditation is a mechanical way to experience higher levels of consciousness. How many have done it? I see people who are attempting meditation all they do is a mechanical exercise in the physical world, trying to move away from the physical into something that is sub-physical. How can they get up into a higher state of consciousness when they are taking the body to be real? They're taking the meditation to be real? They're taking the beliefs to be real? They're taking the whole system here to be real? They are attaching themselves more and more to this real physical self and saying, by a system of operating this physical world, we'll be able to get out. It never happens like that. Nobody has woken up like that. If somebody has to wake up from a system which is operating like a dream, a person who is awakened must come up and touch us in the levels of confidence and friendship. I would like to know a person who ever got a real higher level of awareness without a friend. I've never seen it. Why a friend? What is the role of a friend? A role of the friend is to give the confidence and security necessary by which we are willing to shake up the pizza, drop it down and go up. There's no other way that wakes us up. Otherwise, we stay with the attachments and desires of this world and never let go. It's so strong, the biggest difficulty in trying to find out if this world is real or there is a higher wakeful state is this is too real to give up. This looks too real. This holds too real. It's too much verifiable by one sense perception against another. It follows too rigidly the laws of cause and effect and of time and space. Therefore, it's very difficult to let go, especially to let go without the assurance of what you're getting in turn, what you're getting when you let go. You're going into a void? Are you just going to close your eyes and swim away into some unknown region? Nobody will do it. It is not done like that. That is why people do not awaken to a higher level of consciousness and discover the truth of what it is to be a physical human being until they have a friend who is already awakened. Not merely a friend. 
a friend in whom they have trust that he is already awakened and therefore can hold on to the real things and distinguish between what is real at the higher wakeful state and what is unreal at that state. Such a friend in the Eastern tradition we call the perfect master, the perfect living master. Why do we call him a perfect living master? Because he becomes the human symbol of the state of wakefulness. Actually, he's as, as unreal as any one of us. How can he be more real? Supposing you have a real friend in this physical world, in the physical wakeful world, and you have a dream about that friend, the dream of that friend may be the dream of a real friend. But the friend you see in the dream is not that real friend. It's just a dream, copy of that real friend. You may see him in the dream and be influenced by the dream, but when you want to meet the friend, you have to wake up and go and meet the friend about whom you dreamt. Similarly, although we talk of these masters as enlightened people, it is not the human being who has got light and therefore he can talk of something external, extraterrestrial. It's not like that. It is the being is already real somewhere else and appears in our life in the form to which we are accustomed, form of a friend at this level. That is why Whenever we talk of spiritual masters of the East, the spiritual teachers who have brought enlightenment and shared enlightenment with others, we have talked of the ordinariness of those people. They come like ordinary friends in this world and in their ordinariness, they give a message and give a security, love, friendship, security and give a hold and we are able to go and make meditation real and wake up. Unless that happens, we don't wake up. The rest is just talk, speculation, possibilities. So it is not a mechanical process by which we get to know what is real or unreal here. It is a process in which human system of belief, the ability to let go of a particular experience is involved. We are real. Somebody says we are unreal. I, I always question. If somebody says we are all unreal, I say who is talking to who then? If the facts, a questioner can come and say, am I real? The questioner becomes real at that point. If the questioner says, I am here, I am putting a question, the questioner becomes real. How can we say we are unreal when the questioner which is putting a real question is still there? There has been a greatly misunderstood term from the Eastern philosophy and that term is called Maya. Maya has been translated as meaning illusion. And just because many mystics of the East said this world is Maya or this world is illusion, we began to translate this world is unreal. If this world is unreal, what is, what is going on? Where is the reality then? The only reality we know is that we are there and the world exists around us. We know, know the reality. How can this obvious reality become unreal because somebody says it is Maya? This misconception especially in the West, has arisen because of a wrong interpretation of the word Maya. Maya, in terms of illusion, does not mean unreal. Maya has not been used in the Sanskrit text and in the Eastern text to represent unreality. It is supposed to represent the illusion of thinking that to be real which is not and taking that to be unreal which is real. Just juxtaposing the two things is called the Maya. Like how? I have this microphone in front of me. I am using it. You are listening to me through the microphone. I can say, this microphone, which you can see, I can see, is real. What is the truth? The truth is, the seeing of the microphone, the touching of the microphone is real. That's the truth. But the microphone is not. That's the truth. This is Maya. It's a very subtle distinction. The subtle distinction is, that when you have an experience through your sense perceptions, the sensory experience that gives you a feeling a thing exists because you are experiencing it, the illusion created is that you have jumped to the conclusion the thing exists rather than make the simple statement the experience of the thing exists. The experience of the thing is real at all times. There is nothing wrong about it. It is real because we are experiencing it. But to jump to the next step and say, because we are experiencing a thing, 
Therefore, the thing exists, that's the illusion, and that is Maya. So, Maya does not say the world is unreal. Maya says the experience of the world is real. But to jump to the conclusion that because the experience of the world is real, the objects of that experience must be real is an illusion. Let me give you an Ill illustration of it. Supposing you have a dream. In the dream, a man attacks you with a knife. And you look at the knife and you scream. And he still attacks you and you have the pain of that stab wound, stab injury. You scream in pain and wake up. The pain was real. But the knife was not. You don't need a real knife to create an experience of the pain that comes with it. What we jump to the conclusion is that had we known the knife is not real, the pain wouldn't have been there. The maya was that the knife was taken to be real. Therefore, we had the pain. But the pain was real anyway. Real pain does not require a real knife. But when we have real pain, we jump to the conclusion there is a real knife and that is maya. Now understand this whole world is run on that basis. That the whole of life has real experiences. But to jump to the conclusion that because we are having real experiences, there have to be real material things. That is the illusion. It's a very strange situation. Can't we find out what is real or what is unreal? Somebody said, you can ask the scientists, they'll give you an easy way out. There is a tumbler of water lying there, right on the table. That's not mine. Mine is somewhere here. I can find this one closer. This is called finding an example closer home. <laughs> there is a tumbler of water right here, and I am seeing it. Question is, I am seeing this tumbler of water, so are you. Is that real? The answer is yes. Somebody says, are you seeing it? The answer is yes. Therefore, if the question is, is the seeing of the tumbler real? The answer is yes. That reality is not being questioned. The next is, if you are seeing it and that is real, does it necessarily follow the tumbler must also be real? Can you see it without it? Then the answer is, oh, you, you can see it, provided you are just imagining things. You are hallucinating. If you hallucinate that the tumbler is there, then you will see it even if it is not there. Then how do I find out if I am hallucinating that the tumbler is there, therefore I am seeing, or the tumbler is there and therefore I am seeing? The answer given is, ask these people. Are they also seeing it? And I ask A, B, C, D, are you seeing the tumbler? They say, yes, we are. Oh, then we are not hallucinating. That's no conclusion at all. We could all be hallucinating. Worse than that, the worst position would be if there is nobody else. Supposing I saw in the dream the same tumbler, and I had 10 people also sitting in the dream, and I put this question in the dream, is this tumbler real? And I asked those people, do you see it? They say, yes, we all see it. I said, therefore, it's real. And I wake up and find not only the tumbler was not real, nor were those 10 people I asked, which makes it even worse. What is, the, what is the fallacy in this? In this kind of logic that we employ constantly, every day, every moment, to establish the reality of this world. Every day we are doing it. Every moment we are doing it. The fallacy is, we are taking testimony of the very nature of experience, which is under question. If the nature of physical experience is under question, is it real or unreal, we are taking the testimony of the same experience, whether in the form of other people or objects, or other sense perceptions. I can say, if I am seeing it, it is not real, but I can grab it. Yes, I can touch it, therefore it is real. I can use the tactical sense to corroborate the, the visual sense and say, therefore it must be real. Forgetting that the very system of sense perception that gives me the visual sensation of this cup is the very system in the nervous system and the brain that gives me the tactical sense or the taste or any other perception. There is no system of perception that I have which is not physical. Therefore, each one is merely repeating the same thing over and over again. And I am taking that as a basis for considering this must all be real. What is the real way of finding out what is real? Real way is to wake up and find out if there is a higher wakeful state. In the dream, if I were to see this cup, the only time I know it was not real is when I wake up. If I argue in the dream, investigate in the dream, keep on measuring in the dream, 
keep on asking for more witnesses to come in the dream, it will remain real. I can dream all night long and all day long, it will remain real. When I wake up, it will become unreal. Therefore, the level of experience we are having now, which is called the physical wakeful experience, how real or unreal it is, is dependent upon the state of wakefulness, and not upon the testimony of the same level of experience. But what is the relevance of all this? It's nice, it's wonderful, the water tastes good. Hmm, why should I bother if it's real or unreal? It tastes good. It quenches my thirst. It's fine. Fine, if life is doing that for you, don't go into any further questions. If life is quenching your thirst, and if life is giving you the joy and happiness that you expect from having consciousness and experience, don't investigate, don't waste your time with philosophers, mystics, or saints. But if life is not quenching your thirst, if life is mistreating you, if life is not giving happiness, it is making you miserable, is putting you under depression, putting you in doubt and fear. If life is raising more questions than answering, then better get up and ask, what is more real? Is wakefulness more real than what is happening? If so, then awake. If not, remain where you are. These mystics, they never come in a crusading way. Oh, we have come to wake up the whole world. We have to wake up. They say, no, we want to wake up the troubled ones. Those who are unhappy. Those who think this is not for them. Those who feel happy here, let them enjoy. Those who want to sleep and have nice fantasies and, and nice dreams and enjoy it, let them sleep. But those who are troubled, are unhappy, they should get a chance to find out whether the happiness or unhappiness is being created by the illusion or the reality. Now the truth is that the so-called unhappiness, the so-called misery of this physical world is being created merely by this fact of taking the illusion to be real. And that's great. If this is so, then we find a way out. If you look at the nature of unhappiness, why are human beings unhappy? And find out what made them unhappy, you will find they are unhappy because they are taking unreal things to be real. They are taking the attachments to be real. They are taking the worldly responsibilities to be real. They are taking all the externalized part of life to be real. They never go inside to see if they have a higher level of awareness or not. Therefore, they are unhappy. If you want to find out what makes us all the time externalized, you will find there is a little machine fitted into this human body in the head called the mind. And that mind operates 24 hours. And the most obvious form in which it operates and can be seen by anyone at any time is the thought process. We think all the time. And by thinking all the time, we externalize ourselves all the time. We think of that which is connected with our sense perceptions outside. Continuously, a stream of words and images is moving in our head continuously and each one of them is connected with an experience picked up by the sense perceptions from outside. Therefore, this machine, the ticking machine called the human mind, the mental process of thinking is continuously keeping us in touch with the external world and if that external world bothers us, this mind makes the botheration multiply ever so much. Supposing we are afraid of somebody. The mind will say, oh, this may happen, that can happen, who knows, that may happen. If there is one degree of real fear, the mind by thinking makes it 10 degrees. If, if there are 10 possible things that may happen tomorrow morning, all bad possibilities, this may happen, the world may crumble, California may drop off into the ocean, there may be earthquake here, all kinds of catastrophes. If we list out those catastrophes, first of all, none of them may happen. And we are just wasting our time being afraid. But even if they happen, one of them may happen. We are afraid of 10 of them. We have multiplied our fear 10 times. By what process? By the process of thinking. By process of using our mind in order to further multiply the fear that is built into us. We find that this mind, when it is externalizing ourselves, is constantly building up doubts and fears. It's a natural process for the mind to do. You can try it any time. You want to frighten a person, make that person think over and over again. You want to create doubt in a mind's person, a person comes to you with confidence, knowledge, ask that person to think over it 
think over again. After half an hour, the person is confused. He doesn't know what is possible. So many new alternatives have opened up. So this sense of certainty disappears. This doubt and fear follows so naturally by the process of thinking. I have seen it over and over again. Great philosophers, great proponents of the think philosophy. Look at their life. They propound the think philosophy and then they can't face the rest of the world. They are unable to face it because they are so confused. They themselves recognize their whole approach is based upon perhaps, maybe, likely. They are unsure of anything. They ultimately become unsure of themselves. Even of the very existence of consciousness, they become unsure. Such a strong power this mind has upon us, it can create so much of doubt and fear in us. And that in turn creates all the unhappiness that we are talking of. You look at any event or any state of unhappiness and track it down, and you'll find it to these two causative possibilities of fear and doubt. And they both are connected. Doubt comes first and fear follows. Whenever you are not sure, you don't know, you are afraid. Fear is a natural corollary to doubt. And doubt and fear come naturally to us in the human life if we are overusing our minds. And we have nothing else to use. If we do not know any other reality, if we do not know who we are, what we consist of, why we are having this experience, how it is built up, do we project it outside or is it coming from outside inside? What is our state of consciousness? Do we have a state of wakefulness which is better and higher? Is spirituality a real experience or only a, a dope for belief people, for belief systems? If we haven't even any access to these answers inside ourselves, we are bound to be unhappy. Some people look happy from a distance. I travel a lot. I just traveled to the Orient, to Asia. I've been traveling around the world several times, maybe 40, 50 times in the past 10 years. And I travel to a lot of countries in the West, in the East, Occidental cultures, Oriental cultures. And I am trying to find out the perfectly happy person. It's very hard to find. People look happy from a distance. Go and spend time with them. And inside their hearts, they're full of so much pain and suffering and sorrow, unhappiness, disappointments, not being able to get what they expected. People have let them down. There are no real friends. There is no real love. Everything broke up. Why is it happening? It's not happening because what is happening outside. It is because they have nothing to hold on to as real. And they are so attached to these things that they become unhappy, remain attached, remain unhappy, and there is no way to get out. This is actually the scene in which human beings have been placed. In New Jersey, you might have read four teenagers committed suicide by sitting in a car, getting poisoned by carbon monoxide. And when police investigated, they found in the last nine months, several more young people had committed suicide, as if there's a wave. And a new group of psychologists is going in to find out why this is happening. What is bothering them? It just happens to come up in the newspaper. I saw it in USA Today in the plane. But even without seeing it, by my own travels, I know young people all over are unhappy, willing to die. Old people are so many times tempted to finish this whole show. It's not worth it. Why are they saying this? What is their main complaint? What is the complaint of the human being against what is happening in this life? The main complaint is, we don't know where we are going. We don't know what's the purpose of it all. How many know the purpose of living? Hardly anybody. We are just drifting along. Just doing what is supposed to be done in a rat race, looking at other people. They're running to run like sheep. What is the purpose? Why human? What distinguishes us? We are human beings. We are other living things. Ants, creatures, birds, animals, mammals, whales, fish, dolphins. Intelligent, unintelligent, all kinds of beings are around us, living beings. What is so special about the human being? Why are we here? Why are we human? How many of us have the answers? And how many of us have questioned this and found the answer? We are not sure of the answer. We are not even sure if we should question. And if you look at the cause of unhappiness, you will find the principal cause of unhappiness is we are purposeless drifting. We don't know what we are here for. If we don't even know what we are here for, Equipped in a special way, in a different way. This human body that we are all wearing here, I call it wearing because it's very confusion to say we are human. 
Sometimes we wear a body and we are still animals. Some are angels, I don't know. But the body can be very misleading. But wearing a human body, is there something so special that comes as a gift to consciousness that wears a human body that does not seem to come in any other life form? When we look at it, we find there is one gift which seems to be exclusively reserved for this form and that is the gift of free will. The gift of having to make a choice. The gift of being able to make a choice. Or at least believing you can make a choice. The gift of believing one can make a choice. The gift of being able to see options and alternatives and taking one course and not the other. Not mechanically by instinct, not by program in the cells, the genes, but by a choice making apparatus in the head which gives us the sensation and sense of free will. This is what distinguishes us. It makes us different from every other living thing. This particular gift should have given us some indication that we have a different purpose from the rest of creation. But when we do not know why we have this gift, this very gift makes us the most unhappy of all creation. When we do not know what to decide, we become purposeless and we have the drift and we have unhappiness and we want to commit suicide, we want to run away, we want to hit, murder, do violence, do anything just to attract attention and to somehow find out what is going on. We are willing to rattle, shake, do what we like just to get attention because we don't know what's going on. And this gift of free will was the only indication we had that we must have a special role, a special thing to perform here differently than the others that we have been given an option to see things in more than one way, to be able to move more than one way, why not make use of it? When we look at the people who got enlightenment, who awoke and in the state of wakefulness propounded and left for us the message that there are higher levels of consciousness, that this physical world is not the only option we have, that this physical world being taken as reality is not the option and certainly not the option to create happiness, that we have other options. When we look at their statements and look at what they say, it's free will alone that makes us seekers of the other path. Mark this word, seeker. There is no other seeker in this universe except a human being. Only a human being can seek. Why? Because a human being has that particular gift of deciding to go this way or that way. That is what makes one a seeker. And it's only by seeking you can find something. This ability to seek, we just kept aside. Had we taken this ability to seek as the real purpose to seek the truth, to seek the higher level of consciousness. If we had used it like that, we would have established a role for ourselves which would have made life happy. Even today, experimentally try this. All of you present here, try an experiment for one week. Redefine your role. Define your role as human beings, consciousness enveloped by human body, the principal role being to seek a higher level of consciousness. Determine that as your role from tomorrow morning and say, I am going to try and find out what choices I have. Where does my consciousness operate from? Inside the head, behind the eyes, let me try. I'll pull my attention, leave the other things momentarily, temporarily, for a moment aside. Leave all the other distractions and attachments aside and say, just by myself, within my head, within this body, using the body, inside, I want to seek what kind of higher levels I can have. And while I am sitting inside the head, what is my role? How else should I go about? One can decide to go about it as if one is sitting in a vehicle driving along in this world, looking at it like a show, like a drama, like an act going on. Use the body to act the role which is assigned to that body, not to the self and let the self be the seeker. Let the self, conscious self seek within and let the body play a role according to its circumstances. The body has many relationships outside. The body is the son of somebody, father of somebody, brother of somebody, employer of somebody, employee of somebody, working here, there, owner of house, not owner, it's all body relationship. Let the body continue to perform all those roles as an act. 
take it as an act. It has to perform those duties and acts, not as real, but only as an act. And the real purpose of consciousness is to seek if there is a higher value. Live your life once again for one week, and you come back to me and tell me if you have not banished most of your unhappiness in one week. It can be that simple. It looks oversimplification, but that's the truth. You will find that most of the unhappiness is being created by taking these attachments as real and forgetting altogether about the purpose of consciousness which has a seeking built into it. If you seek, then you will find. You seek within. Don't seek outside. Play your role outside. The human role here, it's a unique opportunity which we can find out if we wake up. It is premature for me to make a statement and a judgment here what our role would be if we were in a higher level. Let's go to the higher level, then we'll decide. Let's talk of this physical level where we are having this lecture now. Whatever level we are on, we should decide at that point what is our next step. It is no use talking of a higher level and flying out into that level and then deciding what is happening. We are right here. What should we do here? Play the role appropriately, courageously, vigorously as a duty, as a role in this world in relation to everybody and everything as required by the textbook, as required by the script. And what do you do with that free will, that voluntary freedom that you have? Seek if there is a way of discovering a higher level of consciousness within yourself, of waking up to an experience that is not the experience you are accustomed to. It is very simple. There is no special technique in doing that. The technique is to withdraw your attention from these attachments and put it back on yourself. If you are consciousness with the power to seek, put your attention back on that power to seek as consciousness behind the eyes in your head. That's it. I have said many times, if a person can hold one's attention by closing the eyes, not listening to outside things, closing the eyes, withdrawing the attention, thinking continuously about what's happening in the head, and staying at the third eye center behind the eyes, from where attention is flowing out, if you can reverse the process and bring attention back, you will find out if there is a higher wakeful state or not. Nothing could be more simply stated. But we are so caught up in the external attachments. We don't even try this, not even once. When we start trying it, the mind through the thought process pushes us back again and again to those same entanglements. Try and put yourself back there and perform your role as a human being, as an act on the stage. This stage has been set up especially for us, so that we can perform our role. And this reality of consciousness inside has been set up at this level of wakefulness in the physical body, so that we can seek. Some people say, we would have been much better off in heaven. I question that. I dispute. Because in heaven you know everything. You can't seek. Somebody says, I want to reach a level of Brahman, of a high level of universal mind, where everything is known will destroy the very gift given to us of seeking. If you knew everything, every moment that's going to happen from now onwards, where are you left? You become like a cabbage, you become like a machine. The uniqueness and beauty of the human life is it gives us the power to seek, it gives us the opportunity to seek, and that requires that ab absence of knowledge. It requires an ignorance, which is bliss in this case, because if we knew everything, we couldn't seek. Here is a beautiful situation, the most beautiful. Even the great spiritual masters of the East have said, the highest form of creation known to us is the human form in the physical level. Not even the higher forms. They reject the status of the gods above who know everything. Because they said they cannot seek. Nor can they have the great joy of seeking and finding and yet enjoying what looks real. While this looks real, perform your role here. When an actor acts on the stage, he has to act as if it is real. What would happen if a good actor acting on the stage suddenly turned to the audience and said, look folks, this is not all real, this is just a drama, just a play. He'll be damaging the whole play. Good actors never do that. They act as if it is real. Therefore, we should act in this world as if it is real. But to realize that this is not real, we have to seek within what is real. A person who can combine these two things has found the human role. The human role is to find out how one can act in the illusion as if it is real and discover the truth of the seeking 
within. And this is such a beautiful arrangement. While you are performing your role <coughs> here, your seeking does not interfere. But if you transfer your seeking outside, it interferes. Supposing I say I only want to seek in that particular church, in that particular temple, in that particular group, that particular cult with that particular person. If I seek like that, other people can come and pull me away. Oh, you are going to the devil, you are going somewhere wrong, you are doing something which you shouldn't do. By externalizing even my seeking, I can get subjected to distractions outside. Therefore, I should play my role according to the drama set out outside and seek within, in my privacy. We can all do it. Seek in the privacy of this beautiful third eye center behind the eyes. How many of you are going to be in the workshop tomorrow? Good. We'll try and do it tomorrow. To try and be in the privacy of the third eye center behind the eyes. So we know what it means to be there and to seek there. You seek there and act here and you will banish unhappiness from life. And you'll know there's a purpose in life. This is the purpose in life that you get the opportunity as a human being to seek within the higher dimensions and the higher possibilities, potentials of this consciousness. At the same time, play your role effectively with all the equipment that has been given to us in body, senses and mind to use outside. This is a great combination. We should not miss it. Those who understand it, they understand what is illusion and what is reality and what is the illusion of the human role in this great drama that has been set up for us. I hope today's address will encourage you to explore this great drama, to explore not only the drama of why things are happening outside, but also how are we doing it from within? How do we run the machine from within? What is our relationship with the real creator of the whole show outside? All the answers are inside. You will find all the questions you have ever asked can be answered within yourself just by doing this. If you have the patience to sit within and wait for the answers, you will get all the answers correctly to your questions which you ever put to yourself. The answers are there. You don't have to go outside for the answers. Go outside for playing your role and go inside for the answers to your questions. And you'll get the real spiritual truth which has been propounded for so long by the ancient mystics and perfect masters of the East. I feel very happy to share this joy and this experience with all of you today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any questions on this presentation? I shall be very happy to try and answer any questions. Yes. I was wondering if belief or uh, faith in something, that that act itself inside of us, uh, in itself generates some kind of a mental uh, energy in which we can, you know, carry through a, a problem. For instance, uh, the uh, many of the religionists of the past and going back to the time of Christ and so on, you know, like if your faith is strong enough, you can do this and that and another thing. Uh, if you have enough faith in something happening, like for instance, if someone goes to Lourdes in France and wants to be healed, and a few of them are, uh, what is it that makes some of them healed and others not? Is it because you've got enough faith in something? Yes. If you have enough faith in something, it is as real as any other experience. Real faith is a real substitute for real experience. But you also use the word believe. In uh, some discussions that we have on faith and belief, we distinguish between these two words. You may not because it is just a matter of what words you use. But the distinction that is made uh, by the mystics who discuss this in the English language, the distinction they make is a belief can be a blind faith. You can believe in a thing because somebody said so. You can believe, somebody says, well, right now God is on a visit and is sitting upstairs. He is demanding eight million dollars from all of us. One can, one can make a statement and somebody says, I believe it. Somebody says, I don't believe it. This kind of a 
belief based upon somebody's statement is not called faith. Faith is distinguished from that as arising from a basic experience. Then faith becomes the next step on that experience. Supposing I see the sun rising from the east today and tomorrow and to have faith that sun will rise day after also from the east is considered faith and not a belief because it rose from the east on the previous two days. Most of the faith is based upon some personal experience, but it goes beyond the experience. And to the extent it goes beyond the experience, it builds up on that experience. Supposing we need to climb five ladders to be able to peep the other side, and we have experience of two ladders, faith can take you three more and make you peep the other side, and is a good substitute for experience. That faith, like experience, grows and is dependent upon what is happening while you are having that faith. So faith is a growing process. It's called living faith. A faith that is living is growing along with your experience. If you have experience, you will have faith. If you have faith after that experience, you will have more experience. So there's a continuous cycle that once you start building up faith, more experience comes inward and outward, and then more faith comes. So it's continuously building up. A belief can be a dead belief. Somebody said it, so it's set. You can keep on propounding it all your life and repeating the same sentence which becomes a belief. Belief has not given that strength nor the experience which faith has given. Now these may be just the use of different words, but it is true that if you study human life and the things that happen through faith, it's nothing short of such miracles that you begin to feel faith must be running the whole show. People who have had certain diagnosis made for a type of cancer that could not have been just created by illusion. There are so many biopsies available and then they have faith that they, are, they can get well. The faith has been strong enough that they have gone back to the same doctors and found it was not there. A number of such cases. People have had cures by the waters at the Lourdes in France. They have had cures in their own homes by faith. They have had cures. We have heard of so many masters. People have gone and by the faith they have been able to get cured. So faith healing has taken place. Not only faith healing, faith knowledge has come. Some amount of faith is necessary. You heard the story of the two boys at the beach. With your permission, I'll repeat it. Two boys went to the beach and they saw a holy man making sand castles, sand homes. And the sand homes were so beautiful. One of the boys said, I would like to buy one of these. So he approached that holy man and said, will you send, sell this sand home to me? The holy man said, yes, have you brought the price to pay for it? The boy said, how much? The holy man said, five dollars. So the boy had a five dollar bill, he took it out from his pocket and his friend said, don't waste five dollars, we can go and eat ice cream, we can go and see movies, it is waste to give money for sand. But the first boy said, I like this sand castle so much, I must buy it. So he bought it and took it home. His friend kept on cursing him all along the way. But while this friend was cursing him on the way, at night the same friend had a dream. In the dream he felt he was in spirit form flying through the sky. And he saw that in the sky all the homes were built up of light, illuminated. And he saw such beautiful patterns. After a while, while flying in the sky, he noticed that the design and pattern of those houses was exactly the same which was being employed by the holy man on the beach. So he said, oh my God, that man was not just making sand castles out of imagination. He was probably looking at heaven and making his sand castles. And then he saw in the distance one sand home which looked exactly like the one his friend had bought for five dollars. So he flew past it and as he came near it, he saw his friend's name written outside. He says, oh my God, he got a nice home in heaven for five dollars and I was trying to fight with him. At this time he woke up and he could not contain himself so he went back to his friend. He said, yesterday I criticize you for wasting five dollars on that house. Today I am willing to buy that sand house for five, ten dollars. Make a profit. The friend said, no, I won't sell that. If you want to buy one, go to the same holy man. So this friend ran to the beach, found the holy man making more sand, <coughs> more sand castles. And he said, Sir, will you sell one of these homes to me? And the holy man said, Certainly, have you brought the money to pay for it? 
He said, yes, and he pulled out a $5 bill. And the holy man said, but the cost is $5,000. He said, what cheek, you sold one like this to my friend for $5? What kind of inflation is this? Overnight it has gone to $5,000. And the holy man said, my son, it is not a question of inflation. When your friend bought it, he had not seen the real one. He bought it on faith. You come after seeing the real one. When you get something on faith, you always get a good bargain. <laughs> I'll meet you in, at the workshop tomorrow. And for those who are not able to come in this time because the workshop is full, hope to see you some other time. Thank you for coming and your patience. You have been very good in this lecture. Bye-bye. <laughs>